Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Yeah, well, anyway, tonight we have the one and only, yes, I mean, the one and only Mr. Mr. McCloud of, was it Asheville Paranormal, uh, Paranormal Krypton Paranormal Society? Is that what Asheville, it is? Yes, it is. Asheville Krypton Paranormal Society. How you doing, Brad? I'm Christian. I can't complain at all. Thank you for having me yeah, on your show. Uh, Hey, Christian, nice to see you. It's Dr. Liz. Are you guys seeing a fun screen right now? Yes, yes we are, Dr. Liz. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for having me on your show. I appreciate it very much. Oh, I look forward to learning because I've forgotten everything I know about cryptids, and I think they're fascinating. It's not hard to do. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I tell you, Christian, can you give the audience a, kind of a brief uh, background of how you got involved in uh, cryptids and what, you know, what, how did that become like a major interest in your life? Uh, yeah, sure, no problem. I was uh, when I was a kid. I grew up in a, a small town in Maine, and my grandfather took me in the woods for a walk uh, with my cousin, and uh, we found some huge footprints. And they were huge to me. I mean, I was a kid, five or six. They were big to me anyway, but they were a lot bigger than his feet. And he started kind of having a little freak out. It wasn't really freak out. You could tell he was nervous. And this is a World War II vet. You know, he'd been shot down. He was a pilot. He'd been shot. He was he was tough. He was a bad guy. I mean, you know, he was a badass. He was he was just a cool guy, right? But he got uh, very nervous about the whole thing, and we immediately spun around and went back to the house. And I remember him telling my dad that he found footprints out there that belonged to something called the Boss of the Woods, and I had no idea what that was till many years later. But a little background on that: after World War II, he spent a year in Alaska, uh, like in the middle of nowhere. So I can only imagine what he ran into out there. And I'm guessing that just kind of poured over into the reaction he had when he came back home. So I think that's where that all came from. And then, you know, I was a kid. I used to watch Leonard Nimoy in search of and, of course, the X-Files and all that stuff. And I've always been interested and in, I've been uh, researching cryptid and paranormal behavior for about 24 years now. And I've been very lucky with some of the people I've met. So uh, I can't complain. It's been quite a ride. Hmm. Um, the $24,000 question or $64,000 question, have you ever actually seen one? I have seen a dog man twice. Oh, oh wow. Oh, my word. Yes. I'm shivering yes. in my boots. Yes. Once oh. I was, once I was driving on the parkway completely lost, I looked down over and there he was. And that scared the Jesus out of me and almost ran off the road. And the other time I was, uh, not too far from where Dr. Liz is right now in the, uh, National Forest over there with my team, and uh, we were being stalked by probably a eight to nine foot dog man. Uh, we actually tried getting his picture, but it kept ducking behind trees and things. And uh, we had a few blob squatch pictures. <coughs> but, uh, that's I think what we uh, ended up finding uh, what was following us that day. So yes, yes I have. Could you describe this uh, thing? I mean, could you give us an idea what it looked like? Sure. Um, the the first one I saw was just massive. I can't even exaggerate on how big it was muscular wise it was just massive it was just sitting on this big stump or rock and it had its front arms in front of it at first i thought it was a bear when i drove when i was driving mm -hmm. and then it, and i and i slowed down and i just looked at it and i locked eyes with this thing and i realized that was a massive dog i mean it but it had shoulders and it had its arms and you could see it's pa it was just huge it was gigantic it was just massive mm -hmm. and uh it didn't it could have cared less i was there Brad, it just did not care. It actually locked eyes on me for a second and had like this yellowish green goldish, eye, goldish eyes. And uh, it, it looked at me. I looked at him again. I almost drove off the road. I, I, I slowed down to about two miles an hour. I was just staring, looking at the thing. And then a uh, bumblebee or a bug kind of flew by in its head and it just turned and look at that almost the way a puppy does when it's looking at something. Right. And, uh, and you know, at that point, I just, I didn't even know what to say. I, I didn't even know what to do. I just kind of, drove off uh i was just in shock on what i'd seen it it just couldn't believe that i'd actually seen one of those things but the size and the musculature nature of this thing was just incredible i mean if this thing wanted to pull my car off the road and rip the door off and, and kill me it could have done it in two seconds it wouldn't have it wouldn't have been anything wow uh, it was just massive and it was just jet black <clears throat> and uh, you know like i said and again i didn't see any teeth hanging out it didn't make any you know gestures to me it just kind of looked at me like I kind of got the, you know, what the hell are you doing here kind of thing. And then it could have cared less. 
It right. had absolutely, I was absolutely no threat to it. I knew it and it knew it. So that was, uh, that was interesting. And then, uh, you know, I drove off and I, I, I'm thinking, cause I saw in the rear view mirror, I saw like a big flash of black just kind of disappear like real quick. And I think what happens, I think it just took off, but I don't know. Cause I was going around a bend. It was, it was a very strange, strange event. It took a while to sink in, but, uh, you know, and, uh, it, I, that kind of, cause prior to then, you know, I'd never really believed in dog, man. I always thought it was like a misidentification of a Bigfoot. I had never, I didn't think they were real. And, and I'm, I'm still, you know, I'm a paranormal investigator too, but the whole man turning into werewolf thing, that still doesn't jive with me. You know, I mean, I can, a ghost, demonic possession, things like that. I can get it. I can see that happening, but you know, transmogrification, I just don't see that. I don't see anyone turning from one thing into another. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total mm-hmm. sense. So uh, I think when people talk about dogmen, these things are dogmen all the time. They're xenocephali. They've been around since forever. Anubis was a xenocephali. You know, there's there's reports that Alexander the Great had xenocephali working for him as mercenaries in his, his wars. I think, Pope, you know, all, all his little crusades, sometimes he had the dogmen with him. You know, there's uh, <clears throat> accounts of uh, islands off the coast of India being inhabited by these things. And there were certain rules of protocol you had to follow so you didn't get killed but you could deal with them and they had like the best metallurgy around. So, I mean, these things have been around forever. And I think what happened is just as uh, humanity grew, you know, uh, they just didn't want to be around us. And I can understand that. And I think what happened is it just kind of disappeared into the parts of the wilderness that a uh, few people have been to or a few people dare to go. And I think that's where they are today. And Christian, I think that... Oh, yes, sorry ma'am. to interrupt you. Sorry, right. Christian. That's what right. reports or how did we know that Alexander the Great had dogmen with him? It's how in we... the historic accounts. Cool, I mean, like it, it, I, honestly, or... it, yeah, I mean, you can Google it. I mean, it's right there. Cool. Just Alexander the Great dogmen. It'll talk about how he had them in his campaigns and how they would not, uh, they had their own language. They could understand him, but they had their own language and they used to make these bar chips and sounds together and they didn't need fire and they ate their meat raw and but they were just like they were worth one dog man soldier was worth about 10 or 20 regular soldiers that's how ferocious they were in battle and, wow. uh, oh i they, know if i yeah if i saw one of them in battle i'd be yeah what are you gonna way. do I'd, I'd, I'd be gone see you bye Al. yeah exactly See, not enough money in the world baby no. i'd be playing dead <laughs> <laughs> yeah well, you know and the other thing people always ask me too, um, and, and this goes, you know, for even most large cryptids and specifically, you know, our friend Bigfoot, you know, I always get asked, well, how come we've never found one or how come we didn't, there's not more out there? And I have a real simple answer to that. And uh, you're a scientist, Dr. Liz, you, you'll, this will make sense to you. When Europeans landed on this continent, let's just ballpark, let's, let's just call it 300 years ago, all right? They brought with them several things, technology, the musket, smallpox, disease. And smallpox is one of those specific viruses that'll transmit from human beings to great apes. So if Bigfoot is in fact a great ape or a gigantopithecus or the missing link, then we have some, we have shared DNA. Can we all agree on that? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. So if the smallpox are going to ravage humanity, they're probably going to ravage something on the human uh, tree of evolution, specifically Gigantopithecus or Gigantopithecus or a great ape. So what happened is when there's all these reports of uh, up in Canada of all these natives dying of smallpox and actually Sasquatches coming in for assistance and dying next to them. So we know that happened. There's there's reports of it in the, in the Canadian native uh, folklore. So why wouldn't that be applicable to say Dogman? All right, because we know there's reports about Dogman and Bigfoot running together. I've I've taken reports of that where they've seen both of them and they're actually working in, in tangent. So if if that's a pattern of behavior that's been established. And if one of them catches it, then they're going to give it to the other one. And you know how this thing spreads. I mean, we're going through COVID-19 right, right now. I mean, it's almost the same thing as smallpox was. It's, it's that kind of uh, rate of infection. So I think what happened is all the sick ones died off. It decimated their populations. And it has just taken this last 260, 270 years for their population to get it back where it was. Throwing the fact that Everyone says, oh, well, the deforestation, that's why we're seeing this, we're moving it on the natural terrain. That's a nice thought, but 
Liars figure, figures never lie. All right. This country is 86% intact. All right. From the day that the first Europeans landed here. That means only 14% of this country has been developed. And that includes all our roads, infrastructure, highways, cities, mm -hmm. houses, apartments, malls, everything. Awesome. So if you were ever to look at a map and you're going to see all that green that's untouched, people don't realize how much uh, vast untouched force and uh, area we have. I mean, it's massive. So, oh, I agree. Yes. So there's plenty of room for things to be. Um, like I said, you know, one of one of our hotspot areas is uh, not too far from where Dr. Liz is. And uh, I assure you, I have been lost out there to the point where the radio in my car didn't work. It wasn't getting signal. So it's easy to get lost out there and it's easy to disappear. And it's also easy for something to live out there and not be seen. Now you throw in the fact that they're highly intelligent, they have natural camouflage, and they have an aversion towards humans because they've seen what kind of things we do, not only to ourselves, to the environment. So why would they come around us? Mm -hmm. They wouldn't. They'd avoid us unless they're gonna, you know, unless they're hungry and they want a hot lunch. Other than that, <laughs> they've really got no use for us. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of mm -hmm. where I, I, that's where my realm goes. That's that's kind of what I believe. Um, mm -hmm. and, and to me, it makes sense. It's logical. Oh, yeah. Well, I tell you, the, the thing that really fascinated me was I've seen like these uh, structures that have, mm -hmm. that have been, you know, out in the woods, what have you. I don't know if they're man-made, if it's just, you know, like a bunch of Boy Scouts got together over a weekend and they're just uh, putting these things together. But some of the stuff I really cannot explain. Uh, you know, like you'll see like a, a trees, uh, they're like a, a tree to be w uh, woven into uh, three other trees, you know, kind of like uh, somebody's taking, a, you know, trying to weave a, a, a sweater. You know what I'm saying? You yeah, know, we, like, we have found branches that we couldn't, Tiny and I couldn't move them. For those of you who don't know, Tiny's one of my research partners. And Tiny, he lives up to his name. Tiny's almost seven foot tall. He's about 380 pounds. And he's a, he's, oh, yeah. just, he's, he's a brute. Yeah, he's and, a linebacker. Uh, yeah, yeah exactly. he's just massive. And uh, actually, I still think he's part Sasquatch because if you <laughs> shake his head, he's got the whole thing. <laughs> no, He's yeah, got up that around my structure. Yeah. Oh yeah, up around my yurt, I've seen you know not on my property per se, but I've seen like a, a teepee of sticks, you know. Mm -hmm. And I keep thinking maybe teenagers did it, but you know, you never know. I've heard that Sasquatch can do that, but also now that you say that, I never thought of that. I've have some braided tree branches. Uh -huh. I've had and some trees. Some, yeah. I have some branches that are placed in trees that couldn't have fallen into the the notches of two trees. Right. Exactly. And I've always thought of hanging hanging a swing from that, but it's it's on a ridge. Awful. Anyway, fascinating. Well, well, no, I mean, and then you have to look at it this way. Sometimes look at the size of the branches that are woven. I mean, they're three, four inches thick. Exactly. Now, who can do that? That's not the wind. Yeah, I kind of thought, uh, wow, they, wow, they grew that way. That's interesting. Never we've thought. We've come of up it. on, you know, we've come up on hunting blinds that something or someone made. Excuse me, that someone or something made that were woven together. And they're over. They're, they're probably over a year too old, but they were woven so close together that you could actually still pick them up and move them until they got to the point where they were anchored. And what had they done is they'd taken a sapling tree about two, three inches around, pulled it down, taken the branches out and woven them with other big branches. So now they have these trees growing together. So I mean, it's it, well, no hunter would do that. I'm not no seeing it. Yeah. yeah, it's at first of all, most people wouldn't have the strength to do that because you're gonna have to sit there and hold these things together. And some I don't buy it. You know, um, it, it's just all kinds of things. And that's one of the things you look for. I, uh, on my website, astrocryptid and paranormal society.com, I've got a little, <coughs> excuse me, I've got a little thing there in the bios and it's called Bigfoot 101. And I've written this little thing for people to uh, read if they want to go cryptid hunting and it's kind of stuff you look for and, and things you need to bring with you. Just, you know, safety measures. It's, it's all designed for safety. Um, and, I always tell people, you know, look for tree glyphs, look for tree rubbing, you know, look for anything. Trees are just a dead giveaway because the realistic thing is no one really looks at a tree and says, oh, something happened there. They're just thinking, oh, it's a tree. They're not looking at branches. They're not looking at trees put together in strange ways. They're not looking for tree glyphs. They're not looking for, you know, um, trees pushed down and pointing in a specific direction. And you go a couple hundred yards more and you find another one doing the same thing. You know, that, that happens a lot. What's a tree glyph? A tree glyph would be like... Uh, uh, some trees put together or, or something made with trees, something we were just kind of discussing. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. 
And then, you know, you know, friction burns on branches or branches. These things are so powerful, they can just take their, their hands and their wrist and just twist a branch off four or five inches and snap it. But what happens with that is that they, they get friction burns from the dermal ridges on their hands and their bark. So the friction just, but you see that. And when you find that, you'll, you'll be like, whoa, look at that. So, you know, it's, it's things like that. And they're all over the place. So all you have to do is just kind of pay attention, you know, because they're there. Does anybody have like a like a, any kind of a hypothesis as to why they make these things, or is this like to signal uh, other other cryptids, or is this just? Uh, I, I think that's exactly what it is. Really? I think it. Uh, I, I think that's exactly what it is. I think that that's just something to uh, tell people what it is. Hmm. You know, I I just think it. Well, I think it tells other people. You know, um, you know, or, or I'm sorry, other cryptids. Say hey, this is my area stay out of it or it could be you know giving directions to other cryptids in their tribe you know they maybe they send out people you know soldiers foot soldiers to go check things out before the rest of the pride comes walking them i yeah. mean it's, it's a million like, different things or like uh your head right this way yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly something like that lunch over here you know yeah right. like, like you know we have hobo signs hobo screen yeah. you know how yeah. like the hobos used to do that back in the depression that's what the bigfoot do now they just they use that except they use it with trees so, you know, and it's very possible that it, it could be warning to other, you know, tribes or groups of uh, or bands of Bigfoot, that stay away, this is ours, you know. We just don't know. We don't know. And we don't know what types of Bigfoot, you know, if, if you look at the, the types of Bigfoot, you know, most people agree that there's four types. There's the patty type and, you know, there's the type two, type three, and type four. And some people consider, you know, a dog man a type of Bigfoot. I'm... I've seen one of those things, and I'm telling you right now, Dogman is its own separate entity. Okay. All right. Can you that's... describe the four types a little bit? Uh, sure. There's the type one that looks like Patty. Uh, there's a type two. Those What's are Patty. I'm sorry. Patty, uh, the Patterson Gimlin film. That's where her name came from, Patty. Oh. Yeah. All right. Okay. And type two. Yeah. Huh? Can you guys hear me? Something happened. I'm, I'm not sure what happened. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, you. All right, I'll, all right. I'll look up the film and I'll go check it out. No, that's right. Uh, and then uh, uh, the type three. A lot of people think the type three would be like uh, pretty much a, a Janasqua, which is a, a, a kind of has like a baboon beak on him, like a baboon face, and but he's got regular legs that are uh, plantigrade. They're not digigrade. Dogman has digigrade legs. In other words, you know how they have their hawk bent up and they walk on their digits? That's digigrade, plantigrade. We have plantigrade feet. So a lot of people think that that's one. And then, of course, the type four is uh, kind of like a, a Neanderthal looking, kind of like the missing link. Okay, so you have, like, so number one, Dogman, you have one that looks like Patty, then the baboon faced one, and then a Neanderthal type one. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh -huh. they're they're all different. I mean, they're all, they're all specific. They're, they're all Sasquatch, but they right, just have right. different. Yeah. Right. Track. And like I said, if, if you go onto my website, you'll see like in the pictures, possible cryptids. I've got a picture of every one of them. Up right. There. I want to definitely make sure I have your, I'll, after the show, I'll get your uh, uh, website and make sure it's in the description box below. Yeah, so, no problem. Right, it, looked, it sounded long. <laughs> oh, it's not. You got to be unique. Have to be original. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> oh, man. But I mean, this is just fascinating stuff. And apparently, Western North Carolina is just uh, chock full of uh, these oh. kind of uh, creatures. Well, I mean, look at the history. I mean, first of all, it's all from the Cherokee. You know, uh, where I live in Asheville, 20 miles down the road, is a place called the Devil's Courthouse. Brad, you and I have been there. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's the, the day Devil's you nearly, that's, yeah, that's, right. that's the day you nearly killed me uh, in that tunnel over there off the uh, parkway. Is that correct? Oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about that. That was all designed. That was all by, it was done by design. We were meant to scare uh, you. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> so, so tell me about the Devil's Courthouse. Devil's Courthouse is uh, the home of Sukalu in Cherokee mythos and folklore. And Sukalu is the Cherokee word for guess what? Bigfoot. So oh. even in our national parks right there. You know, and then not too far from that, you have Judicola Rock. You know, Judicola was another Cherokee basically cryptid, but he was a Bigfoot. You know, he's also the slant eyed giant. So you have all this folklore, all of this all myth. You know, all this mythos all tied up in there. And then you have the Cherokee Death Cat. You know, you have all these other names. You know, the Tennessee Howler. You've got all, or the Howler. and the, I'm sorry, I think it's the, yeah, they have the, the Yahoo. All these from the Appalachian regions. 
all combined, but all this all this folklore mythos has always been in the Native American uh, mythos. So it's it's all there. And I'm a firm believer, you know, America, we've been here, Europeans been here 300 years before, you know, America became America. You know, the Native Americans have been in this area for 14,000. So I mean, uh, I tend to listen to Native Americans when it comes to things like this because they know what they're talking about. They know how to deal with it and they know what to do. I mean. Right. I agree with that. And you so, know what? Do we have other little people in Western North Carolina? I don't know Tennessee that sure. unearth a bunch of graves. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so no, we, uh, little Puck, people. I'm so fascinated with them. Uh, Puck wedgies. That's what. That's Puck what wedgies. Puck wedgies or little people, Cherokee little people. You know, just there's uh there's usually three types of little people. Um, one look just like Native Americans are just short. Uh, some of them look just like a miniature Bigfoot, and then some of them kind of look like uh, an elf. And uh, in in Colowee, when uh, now this is allegedly when they were building uh, Western Carolina University. Or parts of it, uh, they were bulldozing, and, and uh, they found all these basically uh, underground houses that were designed for little people. And apparently, they found graves and things like that. And then the state came in, and you, you know, one thing led to another, and then they all disappeared. But they just again, disappeared. It, probably went to the Smithsonian, right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so do you think they're still living around here? With you know, I get reports of them all the time at Biltmore. Mm -hmm. At Biltmore? Oh, oh yeah. my Biltmore goodness. State. Or near the Biltmore State. Mm -hmm. That wow. is fun. So okay, so well, not I, all the time. Let me let me clarify that, Liz. I last year I got quite a few. I have gotten none so far, but again, it's early. Um, my my cryptid reports tend to increase tenfold right around May. Well, it makes sense. Yeah. Well, I, oh. I'm a firm believer that they all. I think they all. Uh, they travel. I think they can eat a lot. And I think what happens is, you know, when it gets real cold, they go south. And then when it starts coming this time of year again, they go north. I mean, think about it. If you're a 10 foot, you know, 1500 pound primate covered in hair, you really want to spend a summer in the Everglades. Oh, I never thought of that. You're going to go north. You're going to go to Canada. And I think they use the Appalachian Trail uh, to go up. And uh, I think even in California, I think they follow the mountain chains just to go up. If you look at maps, if you look at topo, map, topo maps, you can see the train, the route, because they'll go from California all the way up into mm -hmm. Canada, around, and then they come right back down into the Appalachian. All they're doing is just follow mountain ranges. If you if they follow mountain ranges, they can do a complete circle, probably uh, in a year's time. Now, I think that's probably what they do. I think they just migrate, you know. And I'm sure yeah. there's some that some like probably can stay in Tennessee and North Carolina because there's still it doesn't get we don't have real bad winters. But, you know, upstate California, Alaska, things like that. I'm sure they migrate because it's the winters are too bad. Oh, my goodness. All right. So if I'm in Hot Springs and I have a yurt in Hot Springs somewhere. Right. What cryptids might I see if I were looking in my woods? Bigfoot, Dogman, and possibly uh, Pugwudgies. But I would, uh, being the betting man I am, I'd go 70-30 on Dogman <laughs> where you are. I am not excited about that. <laughs> no. That's, you know, that's just a hot area. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of report. I mean, even if, if you look at, uh, or you listen to Vic Cundiff, uh, Dogman Encounters Radio, Vic's a great guy. He's had some people on there that had episodes three miles from where we had ours. So, I mean, that's, and that's right there in that area. And, and like I said, I don't, I don't give exact locations because I don't want people getting hurt or doing something stupid. So we always give everything a code name. Like we'll have it on a map somewhere, but we'll call it like the, you know, the Bermuda Triangle or the Haunted Forest or the Dark Forest, or we'll just give something a, a nickname, and that way no one knows where it is. Mm. And yeah, we keep it. We keep it very, you know, very discreet. Uh, that's one thing. When I help someone, when we agree to help someone or someone needs help, we do it. We don't charge anything. We don't want any money, and we keep it discreet. We don't ever use names. The only thing we do is we'll take pictures, and we might post some of those if we get permission. But uh, we don't put anything on a computer. We don't save anything to computer. It's all written down. Um, the reason for that is is real simple. Uh, we we've, we've been hacked, uh, and uh, it's 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 a scary thing when you get hacked. And I'm not saying I know who did it, but I know what happened. Well, why do you uh, think you got hacked? I think uh, we found something we didn't know about. There was a there was an incident that we don't really discuss in interviews or anything. But I assure you yeah, yeah. Uh, that. Uh, I think we may have pissed off an organization or a right. group of gotcha. people, and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I think at this point in the game they realize that we're not going to be an issue, 
Um, and, and the truth of the matter is this, Liz, and I'll be, for, I've said this before and I'll say it again, I'll say it a million more times. Even if we had definitive proof, like say I had Bigfoot living in my basement right now. Right. I wouldn't, there's no way in hell I'd ever come out with it for two right. reasons. One, I, it, you might not make it to the news conference. <laughs> and, <laughs> two, and nor would Bigfoot. Yeah, exactly. And two, um, do you really want to piss off the people that have been suppressing this? <laughs> well, Brad sometimes does. <laughs> That's Brad. That's go ahead. That's good. Everyone knows where Brad lives. Oh, <laughs> I'm geez, just Brad. <laughs> yeah. yeah all, okay, hey, all they got to do is call me and say, "Hey, don't do this." Yes, sir. Sorry. Sorry. Sir. <laughs> yeah, I'll just turn a few dials. I'll show you. Yeah, them. you go right ahead. You go right ahead. That doesn't work for me. <laughs> wow. Oh. So, is no, there no, is there a likely I'll time be, I'll I'll be in that room with the one light on me, my hands tied behind my back, with the bag on my head. And they'll be all right. Obviously, <laughs> to, I say Mulder did it. Mulder, and, Mulder. And, no, and no one will ever see you again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, now, is there a typ typical time of day to see these things at night? Clearly, no, it, it, a lot of people do night. Like we, we do a lot. Sometimes we'll do stuff at night. Um, I did a TV show for the Discovery Channel with uh, a good friend of ours named Joshua P. Warren, and uh, it was on the Brown Mountain Lights. And Josh was doing the brown mind light aspect, and they asked me to do the cryptid aspect of it. And I asked them, I said, what time would you want to go? And their simple answer was, we'd, we'd rather go at night because it's it's kind of, you know, it's a better time and we think it'll look cooler. And they asked me what I thought. I said, well, it's, it's, it doesn't matter, really. It's day or night. I mean, you, if you run into one, it doesn't matter. I mean, you get just as many in the day as you do at night. Okay, that was but, my question. Uh, gotcha. But we, we, uh, we had a great night, and... Uh, we found, we got infrasound, we found footprints, we found all this stuff, and, you know, I saw a bootleg copy of it. It's already aired in England, I think, on the BBC. I don't know what channel, uh, and I'll be honest with you, they didn't use any of that footage, and mm -hmm. I don't know why. You know, they, they did a good job with it. It's going to be a good show. I think it's probably going to be on for a while, but they just didn't use any of that footage. And yeah, uh, well, you know, uh, you know what? I think all those shows. I mean, I don't watch them too, too often. But Ancient Aliens, <clears throat> and Bigfoot yeah. show, they never are going to find Bigfoot because the show would end. I, I think they just. You, you can tell me you're the expert, but it seems like they never really want to find it. They just tantalize, well, us, titillate us. If I, say? if I may be so bold, Doc, uh, there's no such thing as an expert. I'm a researcher. I investigate. Anyone to tell you they're an expert in anything cryptid or paranormal is lying to you, because there's no such thing. So for someone to say they're an expert in the field, you've got your PhD, you're an expert in your field. Mm -hmm. You have done ten, over 10,000 hours worth of work to make you an expert in that field. When someone tells you they're an expert in something that can't be proven, does that even make sense logically? Oh, yes. See, there it is. You have to, you know, you can do all the research in the world, you can do everything, but until you can prove it scientifically over and over again, you know, it's not, it's not going to be. Oh, and you accepted. know, you never, you never actually prove anything scientifically. You just make exactly. hypotheses and strong suggestions. Exactly. Yeah. So but that's my thing. Cause when anyone tells it, like, it bugs me when I watch TV and you say, oh, paranormal expert. All right. Well, how, what makes you an expert? <laughs> you know, you know, I, I don't think there's such thing as an expert or, or, you know, anyone says it's a cryptid expert. There's no, there's no one's an expert. I, I've got a, a dear friend of mine. I don't have permission to use his name, but. You know, he's uh, he's considered one of the utmost authorities in cryptids uh, pretty much in the country. And uh, he, doesn't he doesn't call himself an expert. So, I mean, and, and he's been dealing with these things since he was a kid. And, you know, that's that's over 60 years right there. So it, it's just one of those things. You just I, I think the biggest problem is a lot of people's ego gets in the way. Because they want to be like the expert or the so and so, and the truth of the matter is, is no such thing as an expert. Yeah, uh, you know, some of the people I've met involved in the Bigfoot field, it seems like their their primary objective is to or goal is to get on TV. Yeah, it's not. Ah. That's I agree. Yeah, I mean, they're they're not out there to, uh, you know, to. I mean, I I'm sure they're out there to, you know do serious research but it always seems like they you know they have a hidden agenda which is uh, they want to be famous you know and uh you get on, you mm. know and, and, and that kind of defeats you know that kind of takes away the the integrity of, of, of you know of, of doing the research i think you know if you're if you're trying to be, you know become famous uh 
it just really t it just it just takes it away. It really does. And um, cool. it, go ahead. I'm just gonna say, well, that's when you get hoaxing. That's when you get people faking evidence or making stuff up. I mean, that's when that usually comes in. It's it's for fame. You know, they want their five minutes. I have I have been doing this for 24 years. I've only been talking about cryptids and the paranormal openly mm -hmm. for about four years, maybe oh. five. I used to do this all by myself, you know, and uh, I uh, I ran into a couple guys here that were dear friends of mine that, that told me that I should, you know, after talking to them, we had lunch for about four hours one day. And uh, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that I know these people. Uh, one of them was a guy named Joshua P. Warren that Brad knows real well. The other guy's uh, named Tom Dienheiser, who's just like a brother from another mother. And the other one's a guy named George Norrie. And uh, they all, we all sat down and had lunch when they were in Ash Vegas. That's what I call Asheville, Ash Vegas. <laughs> over here. And uh, I was talking to them about, you know, I wanted to finish it. My, my thing was, was, like I said, you know, before I start talking about this stuff openly and publicly, I, I probably right. want to finish my PhD up. So you have that, you know. Those credentials, because I'm there. There's nothing in my mind that is more important than education, and that mm -hmm. that's just the way you know I am. That's just the way mm -hmm. my mom. You know, always, you know, if you're educated, then they can never take that away from you. Doesn't yeah. matter how much you owe Sally Mae. All right, but <laughs> <laughs> but you, it also it yeah, also what, gives you wait, Christian. Did you get a degree, and what what are you getting it in? Oh uh, no, you, I've 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 got the, I've got an advanced master's in education. And, nice. Uh, and I've got, uh, I'm actually one class away from a, a master's in American history, but uh, realistically, I'm probably two and a half years away from a, a doctorate in uh, education. Yeah. I was just curious, can you I'm go get it in cryptids? I went, well, my uh, I've never, I don't know if you could, I really don't. And honestly, I, where would you get it? What would it cost? And would it be, you know, a real degree? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I, I've heard of parapsychology degrees, but I don't know who gives those out either. I mean, I, you know, I, I just don't know. I've never looked into it, to be honest with you. Yeah, we can yeah. talk after the show. There's some thoughts I'm having. Yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, one thing about, about you, Christian, I mean, yeah, you're, you know, you like to go out there and entertain the troops, you know, whatever. But yeah. the thing about it is, you're, you, you know, your integrity. Uh, I've known you as, you, you've been a personal friend of mine for years, you know, for, what, three or four years now, it seems. And, uh, longer than that, buddy. <laughs> oh yeah, man. I mean, yeah. And like I said, and one thing about you is, I mean, you're, you're not a BSer. You, you tell it like it is, you know, and, uh, that's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the things I really respect about you. And that's the reason why I wanted to bring you on the show. Cause you're, you know, you're, you're actually going to tell us the truth. You know, you're not out there to try to hype something up to make it bigger than what it is. I mean, you're just going to lay down the facts, the way things are, the way you observed them. And I, and that's one thing I really do respect about you. And I, I mean that sincerely. Well, yeah. thank you very much. I mean, and I met me. Christian. I met you. I might have met you in Asheville with Josh, but I also met you in Las Vegas. And I remember I was just walking by the table, and you just said, "Here, take this." Uh, he has a. You have a product called Holy Roller, like this holy. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, "Here, just take it." He probably thought I needed it real bad, but he gave it to me, and he said, "Just pick a crystal or two. You just made me pick a couple crystals. I still have them." And yeah. um, I just thought that was so sweet of you. You're just you're a man of heart, and I appreciate that too. Well, I have a question you were for in you. the city of sin, and you seem like such a nice lady. I didn't want anything to happen to you. <laughs> oh, I, well, no, just kidding. <laughs> so, no, no, no. Um, I, I don't know. I just try to bring love and light, you know, with, with into the world. And you do, you do. Oh, but I have a little teeth too. Like no one steps on Liz, <laughs> but no. I'll, I'll love you till you step on me. Then I bite. I got long teeth. Anyway, so um, do have you seen any other cryptids? Um, I haven't physically seen Bigfoot uh, or a Sasquatch, but I will say this, uh, Tiny and I, and uh, a person that uh, was associated with us for a while, um, very nice person, just decided they wanted to go a different way, and they have always asked us not to mention them in anything we do, and when we, like I said, we're still friends, so that's not a problem. Um, we were out in uh, one of our locations, and I'm going to tell you something right now, Doc, it was not too far from the yurt. And uh, I found these these pictures. The pictures uh, I'm going to talk about. They're on the website under uh, possible cryptid evidence. But I believe there were 21 and a half by 11. Uh, there was a hand print in the side of a hill, and what this thing had done was stuck its hand up in the mud to climb up a hill. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And that is where we found that blind that was made. Out of woven branches and trees. Uh, 
the uh, a lot of the the natural leaf uh, placement was was uh, just deteriorated because again this was in the spring and the foliage hadn't come back 100 percent yet but there was some bushes off to the side and some trees off to the side that was very thick uh, it was it was a lot of evergreen um, and as I was up there I heard this but it was so loud that it actually shook my chest. Now, I don't mean to be disgusting, but I had had a little bit of a chest cold and it actually knocked phlegm loose in my chest. That's oh, how wow. loud it was. That's how, that's how bad that was. And uh, at that point, we, I, I, I know this is going to sound stupid, but we always go out armed. Always. Everyone's got a permit. Um, and it's not basically for uh, anything on any cryptid uh, unless we would need it. But uh, it's just basically for protection because you never know what you're going to run to out there. Um, yeah, especially human. No, just exactly. <laughs> well, no, I, that's actually where I was going, but I was trying not to say it. Thanks, Liz. But uh, <laughs> uh, And uh, this was the one time, and this is why we did this. Uh, they were doing a, uh, a cleanup in the area we were in. And where we had to park, we had to walk in through the woods. And I didn't want anyone scared. So I said, you know what? Just leave the guns in the car. No one bring a gun. Just don't worry about it. And in my mind, we weren't going to find anything because this was just kind of like a little routine thing. We, were, we got the new person with us and we're going in and we're just going to see what they can do, see if they freak out, blah, blah, blah. And it was probably one of the most active times we'd had in a long time. And that's where we ran into that dog man that was pacing us. I, I, there isn't a doubt in my mind that's what it was because I, I saw the ears duck behind a tree and uh, – we started going the other way and that's what led us to running into the, the big guy. Now, whether or not it was pushing us that way or not, I don't know. I don't know if it was working in tandem, but I will say this. Uh, the second I got growled at the second time, tiny was right behind me. Okay. And so hold on, hold on. I got to interrupt you, Christian. Cause can you start from the beginning? So you're at, you get to this site, uh, sure. you're cleaning we're at this up site, so you we're finding, the we're, woods and then yeah, continue. Yeah. Right. We're, uh, there is a cleanup, so we just walk on it. We just there over here. We walk the other way. Um, never been down in that area before. Uh, there was something else I wanted to look at, so we go and check that out. And then we just keep going, probably two or three, maybe four miles in. And that's when we started. You know, I started hearing footsteps that were bipedal, and uh, I didn't want to scare anyone. So, and the other thing is, I didn't know what it was. So, not everything's Bigfoot. Not everything's you know hiding in the shadows waiting to get you. You know, sometimes it's just a, a squirrel or a record. Any, it could be anything, you know. But, you know, uh, but when you start hearing bipedal footsteps again and again and again and there's nothing there, then there's something there. Does that make sense? Right. So I, I told Tiny, I said, listen, I think we're being followed. And Tiny grew up in uh, the eastern part of Tennessee in the mountains. It's hard to even get Tiny to put shoes on. Uh, Tiny's only happy <laughs> if he's running around. Again, this is why I think he's part Sasquatch because Tiny's only happy when he's, you know, running around the woods barefoot. Um, and he, I told him that and he looked at me and goes, yeah, I heard it about 15, 20 minutes ago. And I just looked at him like, why didn't you say anything? He goes, well, and, he, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know. So we uh, all of a sudden we look up and there's these tree cliffs and they were huge. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe, you know, because we always look for storm patterns. So there, it had been, we had had storms. But here's the thing. We couldn't find the stumps for these trees. They had been put in an X formation that was like perfect. All right. And they were all over the place. Oh. All over the place. And none of them had stumps, which means something had pushed them over. And, that, and, and that's the other thing. One of them had had the whole root ball with it. And there was no hole anywhere where the root ball was. So all these tree, uh, tree uh, glyphs have been put together, these massive X's. I mean, these things are probably 17, 18 feet tall, just trees uh, put together all over the place. And there was some on the ground. And then we found, uh, you know, some more tree, uh, some more smaller trees woven together. And, uh, and we just start taking pictures. And there it was. I looked down. There's a footprint. So I get the tape measure out. I'm measuring. We're taking pictures of that. And about seven foot away from that footprint, maybe six and a half foot away is another one. So it was right and then left. Does that make sense? So mm -hmm. we're following these. So we're following these things at this massive stride. And these are huge footprints. And then we get to this hill. 
Well, the hill, like I said, had been raining, and there was, you know, it was there was a lot of moisture under the under the leaf litter, and something had stuck its hand into the side of the hill, and I think what it did was just use itself to pull itself up the hill, and uh, I, I I remember sticking my entire hand into basically what would have been maybe a finger and a half of his, or right. it's, and there's a picture of it, like I said, on the website. And on the, on the, you'll see like my hand in this hole. And if you look over, you see the whole rest of it. That's something's hand sprint. It's just, it's like it just stuck it in. And, and we climbed up that. And that's where we found that first blind. And we're getting pictures. We're getting ready to take pictures and everything. And then that's where we heard the. <clears throat> and I turned around and then I got. <clears throat> and then it kind of sounded like a growl. Now, at that point. This is what Tiny said, because I don't really remember doing it. He said my right hand kept going down on my hip <laughs> like I was feeling for something yeah and all I remember tiny saying is you gotta understand you gotta hear tiny's voice he's he's got that real southern target of Chris you ain't got your gun we ain't armed <laughs> <laughs> oh, we ain't armed we ain't armed oh, no. I'm like all right I said tiny just put your arms up and back out and as I said that I looked behind me tiny's like 10 feet behind me already moving down the hill <laughs> <laughs> And I'm oh, sitting there. I'm sitting there. I can't see this. I know it's there because you can feel it. You can just feel something's there, and you can hear it. And I'm like, uh, "Sorry, sorry, man. Sorry, <laughs> whatever. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, so sorry. Just put it, put it on me. Sorry." And uh, we we just started getting out of there. And then uh, while we're going down at this point in time, we look down the hill, and Tiny looks down and he, and he points to the ground, and you can see where deer had been bedding down. Mm-hmm. And this is right down the hill we just came. So what I think they were doing is they had that blind built because they knew deer were sleeping there. And they were using that hill to get, you know, get more speed so they can, can get dinner. So I think it was all like set up for that. And even on the way out, uh, we were finding like we found this one place where there was wild turkey feathers and there was a pile of them. All mm-hmm. piled up. And uh, there was some blood on the floor or there was some blood on the ground, but these Obviously, something had pulled the feathers off of a turkey and eaten it. Um, uh, we didn't, I mean, but it was in a pile. Mm-hmm. Uh, when we found that, and that's when we found that, that's when we were starting to realize we were being followed again. Except now it wasn't just me. Everyone knew it. And uh, that's when we decided it was time to leave. So, yeah, there's there's uh, all kinds of stuff out there that uh, can mm. uh, ruin your day. <laughs> I was, oh. was going to ask. I don't know that they could get enough to eat all that mass. Even all the deer, it seems like they would totally decimate the deer population. I don't think so because realistically, I don't think there's ever been more deer in the country than there are there are at this time. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, and that's one. And two, I, I honestly think they're herbivores as well. I think they eat right. a lot of vegetation. Well, what I know, what do I know? But that's what I would imagine. Well, well, I mean, you know, look at grizzly bears. You know, take bears as a, you know, there's the bear yeah. populations come back. I mean, there's more black bears now than there ever has been. Uh, as mm-hmm. far as I, now, that's what I was. I don't know how true that is. I've never looked it up, but that's what I've heard. And uh, especially in North Carolina, and they don't have a problem with food. And I mean, if you think about it, now we've got. I think it's all once you have the healthy ecosystem. I think everything works in twine. And the other thing is this: um, when you have more of a food supply, then you're going to have more of the predators that live on those food supplies. And here's here's my example on that: when you clear cut something, and uh, I'm first of all, I'm not a big fan of doing that. Because I'm a firm believer that if you cut one tree down, you should plant 10. Mm-hmm. I just, that's my belief. You know, I'm a capitalist. I believe in, you know, you got to, you know, you got to expand to grow. I'm fine with that. But you need to take care of the environment. And there's no reason why we can't replenish our resources for the next 100 years while we're doing yeah. it now. There's just yeah. no reason. There's no, it's stupid not to. So if I'm a firm believer, you cut down one tree, you should plant 10. And then you have, you know, in 20, 30 years, you got another four. You, can, you know what I'm saying? So it just, to me, that makes sense. But when you do that, what ends up happening is that entire area that's been clear cut turns into basically, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, a meadow or a prairie. And all this grass starts to grow. Well, what eats grass? Deer. Mm -hmm. So you got more food, you're going to have more deer population. Well, what eats deer? Predators. And you got more food, you're going to have more predators. And I think that's what's been going on lately. I think think that's why we're having these sightings is because we've got more, they've got more food. 
They've got plenty of area to run around in. And it's just at the point now where I think the fact that they're very opportunistic and that's what brings them in closer to uh, the outbands of society is, you know, if someone's living out in the sticks and they've got, you know, garbage cans that aren't tied down or aren't locked down or, and there's food in there or something they can eat, you know, that's going to bring them in closer. Does that make sense? That's just, that's the theory I have. So, that I mean, makes, I think that's why. That makes really good sense. That makes yeah. sense. And I have another random question, but a lot of people, I used to do a lot of cryptid research, but I think I stopped about four years ago. I just thought, oh, wow, this is fascinating. I probably never see anything. <laughs> um, I've heard that, that people think that maybe Bigfoot is multidimensional and kind of phase in and out. What do you think <laughs> of that? I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> oh, I, I've met a lot of people that believe that. Uh, yeah, I know there's yeah. one specifically you're going to bring up, isn't there? Yeah, I well, I'll... I'll I'm just saying, I, I, the people, there have been sightings with them with little small grays and little brown critters, little fuzzy bear cr you know, uh, critters and stuff. Again, first and foremost, I'm a cryptid investigator and I'm a paranormal investigator. Right. Oh, yeah. There's no, you, you have to have evidence. Like, we have documented evidence on our website of an entity opening up the back door of a bar that Tiny's currently reinvestigating right now. All right. That's evidence. Show me something phasing in and out of reality that's corporeal, that's different. That's transdimensional, yeah. that to me is a science aspect. That means it's of a higher level than we are uh, mm -hmm. scientifically. Mm -hmm. I don't get that with the foot oh, oh, because yeah. I, I don't see that. I think it's a North American primate. I think they've been here longer than us. I think they're going to eventually going to be here longer after us, mm -hmm. depending on what we do. All right. It just it's just the way it is. It's the same thing with the Cenocephali. All throughout the historic accounts, the Cenocephali has been around. The Egyptians used to worship them. Alexander the Great used to hire them. I mean, these and you know, traders. Marco Polo ran into Cenocephali. You know, this is all in written accounts. You know, mm -hmm. so oh yeah, oh yeah. I even it's read, all throughout the historic record. Yeah, I even read a newspaper article. I think from the uh, late 1700s, where there were some frontiers or frontiersmen. Mm -hmm. Uh, who were fighting uh, these hairy men? I think is what they called them. They were like, yeah, a, yeah, out over there uh, again, over uh, western North Carolina, near the uh, hot springs. I guess to be west of uh, of Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, they yeah. were, actually had a battle with these uh, creatures. Well, look at you know in 960 A.D. Leif Erikson lands in Canada, and the first thing he runs into is a hostile band of you know Bigfoot. He wrote about it. You know that's that's why they left. Wow. So, I mean, this is all, it's all there. I mean, and here's another thing. I love, you know, I like, this is just, I have a few theories and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that the national park system, if you put, if you do the history, who put the national park system in play? I thought it was uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, that's exactly who did it. Mm -hmm. Now, are you ever going to find a bigger environmentalist president than Teddy Roosevelt, no matter what anyone else says? What was that guy's whole thing about? Preserving nature. I mean, he, he loved nature. He was a hunter. He was a he was a fighter. Yeah, you know, he was probably one of the greatest men that we've had sitting in the Oval Office. But he also knew how important natural resources and nature were. Mm -hmm. So, let's just say he might have known about these things. Why wouldn't he give them all that land and preserve it forever? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I mean, he's. Teddy Roosevelt's the one in, in his book, The Wilderness Hunter, he's the one that recorded the Bauman incident. He wrote about that. He believed it. What was that incident? The Bauman incident. There was two hunters uh, that were going beaver. Uh, they, were, they were hunting beaver. And uh, they go out on this real far, I think it was in Montana before it was a state. So it was the Montana Territory. And they go out. I could be wrong on that one. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Montana, though. And they go, well... Uh, and they were even told by uh, the Native Americans, "Hey, man, don't go out there. That's that's you know, that's where the wild man is. The hairy man's out there. You don't you know you don't need to be out there." And because the 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 uh, fur was so plentiful, they went out there anyway. They're out there for a day. Uh, they set up their camp. They go lay out their traps. They come back. Their tents or their lean tos destroyed, and something had gone through their stuff. And they put it all back together, and they go to bed. Uh, that night they have all these, they're hearing things, they're seeing things. Uh, one of them shoots at something, doesn't know if it hits or not. And the next morning they said, Hey, this is ridiculous. Let's get the heck out of here. So one of them decides to break camp. And the other one says, I'll go get the traps. Um, the guy that got the traps comes back to this, the, uh, the, uh, campsite and his partner had actually had puncture marks in his neck and his head had been turned around. 
Oh. And I guess his body had been smashed up against a tree. So it was it was not a pretty sight. And uh, he just he started running and, and then uh, he just left. Um, they had left their horses tied up like 10 miles down the road, I think, or something like that. But it's that's the nuts and bolts of it. And, uh, you know, it, it was definitely uh, and when they they uh, they may have been not may or may not have been a sighting. I can't remember. But mm. uh, it was definitely chalked up as a Bigfoot attack. So, I mean, you know, and uh, the guy that lived, uh, Bauman, he ended up working for uh, Teddy Rex on his ranch. I believe it was in Montana. And one night they're sitting around a campfire uh, and he tells him this. And he actually put that in his book, The Wilderness Hunter. So, I mean, he, he was a firm believer in this, which I find kind of coincidental that he's the one that decides he's going to sign the National Park System into law. So, uh, but then again, I don't believe in coincidence. So, right, right. Oh, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Go ahead, Liz. No, I was gonna say, uh, what else would you want us to know about cryptids that we haven't asked or we haven't hit on tonight? I would say any, you know, just if someone decides they want to go out cryptid do cryptid research, um, I don't think the term cryptid hunting is apropos. I think that's actually a bad use of vernacular because. You don't want to hunt something that's a better hunter than you. So I, th I like the term research. <laughs> but when you, if you decide you're going to go out researching or investigating, you have to be smart. Don't ever, 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 never, ever do something that's going to put yourself in danger. It's just not. It's stupid. Always make sure no one, someone knows where you are. Uh, always know when you, you know, make sure someone knows when you're coming back. And uh, like I said, if you go to my website, uh, it's uh, astralcryptidparanormal.com, astralcryptidparanormalsociety.com. Um, and you go over, there's a little section called bios, team bios. In there, there's a thing called Bigfoot 101. And that's just something I've written up. It's just a little, it's, it's, it's for anyone. Anyone can have it. But it just tells you kind of what to bring and what to look for. And, uh, and, and also tells you what to bring on X amount of time. Like if you're going to spend a couple hours in something, you know, uh, bring this. If you're going to stay the night, this is what you should bring. And uh, one of those things, you know, I think some of the stuff like this is just something I wrote. But, uh, you know, if something I always bring with me, no matter what, no matter what, this is always with me. Cell phone, number one, because you can use that as a camera. And if you're not out of range, you can use it for help. Two, protection. We always bring firearms, um, but again, we're trained and we have licenses. Right? Always bring a notepad, pen, and pencil. Always, because you might want to sketch something. And here's something I always have at least two or three of, tape measures. And here's why I always have tape measures. Just the little, you know, the little 10-foot tape measures? The little mm -hmm. yellow ones that you can get for like three or four bucks? Mm -hmm. I always have two or three of those, and here's why. The days of plaster casting, I won't carry, I'll make tiny carry the plaster. Plaster is 30 pounds, plus you got to find water. I'm not carrying that. It's not worth it. So right. what we do is we just take a ton of pictures and we measure them and we go length and width. And cryptids usually follow something called the 150 law. If something is 20 inches long, if it's cryptid, then it's probably 10 inches wide at the widest part. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. huh. and, and usually there'll be a mid-tarsal break and right in front of the mid-tarsal break is usually the widest part. So always bring that, always bring extra, uh, always bring extra, extra. Uh, tape measures because you never know because if you run into a bunch of stuff you want it measured i've run in i've had i've actually had five or six tape measures out at one time measuring stuff while i was taking pictures because we not only had footprints uh, uh friction burns but we actually had head breaks where something you could see where something went through it looked like it made a tunnel and you know you want to measure that you want to measure the distance so you want you want it all as scientifically accurate as possible does that make sense yeah and you can do that it's it's easy to do when you have tape measures and if you don't have tape measure use like uh, something you can use to scale like you know uh, a mag light or your own shoe uh, there's a couple pictures um, we have tiny's got a size 16 or 17 foot and uh, we found a dogman track and the dogman track is dwarfing his foot in the front and you can see that and it's just but you have to have some stuff to, to measure um, the other thing I always recommend bringing in I don't care if it's high noon always have a flashlight uh, bring a digital recorder, camera equipment. We always bring camera equipment no matter where we go. I actually bring Kiger counter with me. I've actually got a place where uh, it's radioactive. I don't know how, 
but it's always it's always banking on the, the Geiger counter, and that's one of the things we call the Bermuda Triangle. And I actually think that's alien. I could, we can talk about that later if you want. The other thing, uh, always bring extra batteries. Always. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you always mm-hmm. die yeah. on when you're doing your research or your investigations, doesn't it? I have had bad. I have had brand new batteries at a pack die. I, I can't explain that. I've had cell phones go dead. We walk away from the area. Fifteen minutes later, I look down. <clears throat> the battery's at ninety percent. I I can't explain it. Um, always bring water, no matter what you're doing. Always bring water. Uh, bring snacks. And here's something I always tell people. I carry three compasses with me. All right, and I carry good compasses. I get the military the static. I get the good ones, or I'll carry the marbles compass. I carry good compasses. All right. Make sure you learn how to use a compass properly. Yeah. There's a lot of people have a compass and think, oh, I just it's just pointing it. That's not how it works because there's declination, there's there's topograph, there's a lot to it. So always, always make sure you know how to new uh, know how a compass works. Always have maps in the area. Before we research an area, like if someone tells me they're having cryptid activity, the amount of research we do before we even step foot on the property is ridiculous. Because we go back as far as we can in the history, uh, history, his geography of that area, and then goes we look at who owned the house, who owned the house prior, who originally owned the land, and we do that with the paranormal investigations too. We go back as far as we can. We look for any crimes or incidents that happened there. Has this happened before in the past? Uh, we had a house one time that was having some cryptid activity. They had the same thing reported in the seventies. Wow. So, so it's just you have to do research, um, and again maps. The other thing, and this is just stuff we carry. Uh, uh, we carry gloves and a plastic bag for DNA and hair samples. Every once in a while, I will take one. And the truth of the matter is, I usually put them in a shoebox, and I don't know where I put them because uh, <laughs> I can't afford to have stuff sent off to for DNA testing. I mean, it's it's, it's like five grand or something, so I'm, I'm out on that part. But it'd be nice to have. Uh, if if you have it, just get it. Just be careful so you don't contaminate it. All right. If you do something that's overnight, all right, more than three nights. Always, always bring extra food, extra water. Make sure you've got camping equipment that is together and in good operational condition. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people, they go break out their tent and they don't have the poles. Or the tent's been, you know, sitting in storage for 10 years and the whole bottom's dry rotted. You have to go through your equipment and make sure it's in proper working order. Always have weatherproof materials like tarps. I always, I've got two tarps in my car right now for no reason other than camping. All right. Cause you lay one down, then you put another tarp up over your tent in case there's bad weather. All right. Uh, you, know, you can uh, use a sheet of plastic, a roll of exactly, plastic. Exactly. Anything. Work. Yeah. Well, yeah. anything, anything, but you have to have it. Now, the other thing I, we carry with us is uh, rope and paracord because you never know uh, when you're going to have to tie something off. Uh, yeah. It's also, we've also made trip wires around the place at night with paracord. Uh, the other thing is, again, extra batteries, extra flashlights. And I am a big fan. I buy glow sticks. I get them mm-hmm. by the case. Mm-hmm. I love those things. Because I used to, when I was a diver, I used to use those too. Because we used to put them on the back of our tanks during night dive so we could see what people were. Uh, again, fire starting materials always have. People think, oh, hey, it's, the matches are always going to work, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no. You have to have back. It's, gotta, it's about redundancy. You have to have backups. I've got my Zippo, but nine times out of ten, that's not going to work. So I've got the little Bic lighter. If that doesn't work, i got a backup pick, and then I've got waterproof matches, and then I've got my magnesium ferrous rod. So I've got, you know, I'm prepared. That sounds like my bug out bag. Exactly. Because yeah. that's what it, that's basically what it is. Uh, always have, always, always have a utility knife. I've got two or three knives on me when I'm out there. I've got my uh, my good old Marine K-Bar knife. I've got that on my utility belt. I've got my Swiss Army knife in my pocket, and I've probably got another two knives in my gear bag. A uh, fixed blade and a folding blade, because you never—that's probably your most handy tool. Yeah, uh, like, oh, you know, this tiny you carry know. that. Yeah, oh, tiny's got tiny's got the same thing. I literally put a lot of stuff. I when I say redundancy, I uh, Brad's seen my vest. I wear a vest. It's a it's a military vest, but I wear a vest, and I literally put that. I've got enough stuff just in the vest alone where I could be fine for two or three days. I've got backup compass. I've got uh, the other thing I keep are those mylar bla- uh, mylar uh, blankets, you know, to keep you yes. warm and waterproof. I've got two or three of those. I've got in my camera bag. I've got a little bug out bag. So even if I just have my camera bag, that's all I need. I've got a compass in there, knife, fire starting equipment, glow sticks, mm-hmm. flashlight. I'm just a firm believer in being prepared for anything. 
I've got that. I've got extra stuff that I've got everything I need pretty much in my vest. Now, I am a huge, huge believer in keeping flashlights. Don't buy the cheap flashlights because they're cheap junk. You don't want to put your life on the line with a $2 flashlight. You know, spend mm -hmm. spend the money. All right. Buy good equipment and it will take care of you. All you have to do is just take care of it. You know, and that old saying, you get what you pay for. That's 100 percent true, specifically with camping equipment. If you buy cheap equipment, then it's not going to work. Right. 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 The, other thing, the other thing you have to do is, again, I already said keep extra maps and extra compasses. I can't emphasize, but you have to have the knowledge. They're not going to do your darn bit of good if you don't know how to use them. Right. It's just not going to work. All right. I'm a firm believer in having a GPS transponder. If anyone's ever heard of David Pilates and Missing 911, he says if you keep yourself more in a group of two people, got a firearm and a GPS transponder, you probably aren't going to disappear. And don't be last in line. <laughs> and never be last. That's why um, I let Tiny. Tiny's always behind. Uh, now, I got a question for you. Speaking, if I was going to mention him, like, do you connect um, – the missing 911 missing pe missing people with bigfoot at all okay that's a good question and the truth is i don't know but it would not be out of the realm of possibility i look at the dennis martin case that happened in the smoky mountains i believe is in the late 60s early 70s i can't remember but that to me from the witness report that they saw something that looked like a gorilla pick up a kid and throw him over the shoulder and just run in the woods with him to me, that sounds like a Bigfoot. And then, you know, uh, there have been other uh, issues in that area prior to that. So I honestly think it would not be out of the wrong possibility. It's possible. I know David Pilates doesn't like to commit, but I just, you know. Well, I understand that, but he's. You I know, totally had, understand that. Mm -hmm. Well, His here's the thing with him. Facts. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm a, I, I respect him for what he does, but let's look what he does. All he does is he takes all this work that's already been done and puts it together in a book. All these, all he's doing is taking reports that have already been made and collecting them and putting them in a book. It's brilliant. The concept's brilliant, but he's made people aware of how many people disappear. All right. And he's probably saved a lot of lives by doing that. But my question is this is why doesn't he talk about what he thinks is going on? Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. my question okay. to him. I, and I, get it. I mean, that's his prerogative. That's and I have nothing but respect for the man. You know, he's a Bigfoot guy before he was anything. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's right. And I have some yeah. more questions about Bigfoot, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Go ahead. When you rock or think about Bigfoot, Christian, do you ever think, I've heard stories where people are taken captive and like made part of families, like of prides or pods of Bigfoot. And uh -huh. then my like, question is, do you, do you agree when I hear stories about people leaving them gifts and having a sort of friendly gift exchange with Bigfoot? I, I've, uh, well, first of all, the, if you go back again, the Native American folklore talks about Bigfoot taking women and children, all right? And then sometimes a woman would come back to you a year later pregnant or something like that, and they usually and it never has a good ending. So I think that's that probably has happened because, again, I am a firm believer. If, and again, and let me just preface this. If the world would listen to the Native Americans more mm -hmm. and live the way they tell you to live, the world would be a much better place to live in. And that, as far as I'm concerned, that goes across the board for Native Americans. I don't have a particular tribe, but I'm talking I'm talking about Native Americans in general. Because down to their core, they learn to live in peace with the earth and each other. And mm -hmm. everything that lives on the earth. Mm -hmm. And they've been here a whole lot longer than us. So if they're telling you this is how you deal with something, that's how you deal with something. If they're telling you to, hey, be careful when you're around this so-and-so because this can happen – that's what's going to happen. That's what you need to do. And I think that's our biggest mistake is we think we're smarter than everyone. You know, we think we know better. Well, you don't because again, they've been here 14,000 years. We've been here 300. Look yeah, at the timeline. That's a lack right? of humility. What do you think that Bigfoot yeah. thinks of us? I know that's a big generalization, but any thoughts that you think of, what do they think of us? Paying the butt, a good snack? Probably insignificant. Yeah. <laughs> In the grand scheme of things, I mean, what are we? We're weak. We're hairless apes. We can't see in the dark. We don't, compared to them, we're not strong. We can't run fast. If you look at it this way, you know, they are designed. This is going to take us off in a whole nother. I'm just going to do it. This is going to take us off in a whole nother plane of thought. He went there. Sasquatch, if you look at Sasquatch, the way Sasquatch is designed, he's designed for life on this planet. All right. They've got the night vision. They've got the smell. They've got the strength. They've got the hair. They've got the ability to hold their breath underwater, 
all right, and, and swim. They've got the ability to climb trees, again, and, you know, they're stealthy. They, they, they're they very intelligent. They're organized. They can communicate, all right? They don't need anything to do that. They're born with all this, all right? They don't need clothes. They don't need shoes. They don't need any of that, all right? If anyone's the interloper here, it's humans, all right? So what if they were here first and we were put here? And they just tolerate us until the point they're not going to tolerate us anymore. I mean, if you if you look at the, if you look at the Bible, don't at, at one point in Revelations doesn't it talk about the beasts of the the forest coming and, and claiming ten percent of humanity, or something to that effect? I, I, I can't. I'm, that. I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to butcher that. I just honestly don't That's remember the exact phrase. All Revelation from the Greek, Koine Greek to English. Right, I don't remember. Right. I'll look it up. But it's something like that. So what if they were here first? And we were just placed here because realistically, I mean, what, you know, do we really belong here? We can't swim underwater and hold our breath. We can't, you know, we can't breathe underwater. We can't see at night. We don't have retractable claws. We have to cook our food. You know, we have to have clothing. We have to have shelter. You know, all these other cryptids and other other animals and things like that, they don't need that. Mm. So if you look at it that, that way, who's who's the weaker, you know, race here? Yeah, I hear um, what you're saying. Yeah. Well, well, this, well, this, has, been, a, this has been really good. Oh, yeah, this is one hell of a show, uh, Christian. I mean, fantastic job here, buddy. Thank you. Yeah. I, and and uh, anytime you guys ever want me on again, I'm a phone call away. You know that. Oh, so. yeah. Yeah, and we haven't even gone into the uh, paranormal investigation part of this. No, either. no, no, I, we I, haven't. Uh, yeah. Because I'm a big UFO conspiracy guy, too. So, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've seen them myself uh, over a, a military base. By, within five or ten miles of a major military base, I saw uh, something that had been like 300 feet long, completely silent, uh, going about 10 or 15 miles an hour, uh, 150 feet off the ground, and it was painted in, uh, I think, Desert Storm Camo Beige. Uh, so, uh, yeah, do the math. That's all I got to yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. Well well, Christian, why don't if you want to just let us know some topics you'd like to discuss, we can have you back on. We love this, and we hope we get more of an oh, audience. Definitely, it's great, definitely. And fun to have you on, and maybe maybe uh, you know, we can arrange. But make sure. How do you want people to reach you? You've given your website. Oh, put it in the description. Sure, box. Uh, you can you can get me at Asheville Krypton Paranormal Society dot com. Um, my phone number is eight two eight four zero seven zero zero four six. And if they just go to my website, all the social, digital media, everything's there. They can get me no problem. Absolutely. And I'll put it in the description box below, and that's great. One. This has been wonderful. I just thank you guys so much. For oh, this well, thank you. I and appreciate you it. You reminded me of all these things I knew. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Awesome. All right. All right. Have a good, good night, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. I'll talk to you later. All right. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye.